This show is not a substitute for professional counseling and no relationship is created between the show hosts or guests and any listener. If you feel you are in need of professional mental health and are a UA student, we encourage you to contact the UA Counseling Center at 348-3863. If you are not a UA student, please contact your respective county's crisis service hotline or their local mental health agency or insurance company. If it is an emergency situation, please call 911 or go to your nearest emergency room. It's 6 o'clock and time again for Brain Matters, the official radio show of the UA Counseling Center. We are broadcasting from the campus of the University of Alabama. Good evening. My name is Dr. B.J. Gunther and I'm the host of the show along with my colleague and producer, Katherine Howell. And in case you don't know, this show is about mental and physical health issues that affect college students, in particular UA students. So you can listen to us each Tuesday night at 6 p.m. on 90.7 FM or you can listen online at wvuafm.ua.edu. You can also also download the My Tuner radio app and type in WVUA FM 90.7. And I'm not sure if there's another new app that um, carries our show also, but the shows are recorded and podcasted um, on Apple. Uh, so, and, and probably other podcasts too, but I'll make that announcement at the end of the show. If you have any upcoming show ideas, please email those to me. We've got a lot of our shows already scheduled for the fall because we only do shows in the fall and the spring and we do about 12 to 13 shows each semester. If you have ideas and maybe we haven't done a show about what you're thinking or what's happening, email those to me at brainmattersradio at wvuafm.ua.edu and of course I'll consider using your idea for a show topic. Tonight's topic is one that we've had, and I was just talking to our guest about this. We've had her on in the past, and I think it is beneficial to probably revisit this topic in some capacity every year because it is a prevalent issue on college campuses. I think I'm safe to say that eating disorders is what we're going to be talking about tonight and specifically group therapy for eating disorders and something that our guest has um, developed and created called college boot camp. So I'll let her talk a little bit about that also, because while generally considered an exciting time in young adults' lives, college can introduce new challenges and pressures that put students at risk of developing eating disorders and unhealthy eating patterns, and also other mental health conditions like anxiety and depression. So that's why it's so important to talk about this topic. And I think it's good that we start the first show off of the season talking about eating disorders. My guest is Sharman Rutherford. Sharman has been on the show, like I said, in the past, and she's back to discuss this topic. Sharman, welcome. Did I, um, did I give your correct last name or did I give the wrong one? It is Rutherford. So okay, you good. got it right. You got it right. <laughs> that, there's a backstory to that because you used to be hyphenated. And I think when you were on the show before, I think I messed it up. So it's okay. sorry about that. <laughs> Give us um, your credentials. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your credentials, and any training in the area of eating disorders. Okay. Um, well, I am a licensed professional counselor. I'm certified as an advanced alcohol and drug counselor, as well as a clinical trauma professional. Um, what I I'm most proud of right now, I'm in the process of earning my certified eating disorder specialist credential through the International Association of Eating Disorder Professionals. So that is something that has been a couple of years in the making, and uh, I should have that hopefully around the first of the year. And that's through what organization you said? The International Association of Eating Disorder Professionals. Okay, because I, I always read an, you know, an article or two before I start the show just to refresh mm-hmm. myself. Even though I've worked here at the Counseling Center for many years and I've seen many students with, I would say, budding to full-blown eating disorders, mm-hmm. whether it's anorexia or bulimia or disordered eating. And... The National Eating Disorders Association is the association uh-huh. I'm most familiar with, especially mm-hmm. in articles that they'll usually be referenced. Right. You know, so 
Um, what is that association? Do they offer certifications also? I, I do not believe they offer certification. I'm not familiar with them. I just know the International Association of Eating Disorder Professionals. They offer the specialized credentials for certified eating disorder specialists and certified eating disorder specialist supervisors. Oh, wow. So um, it's a pretty rigorous um, program. You have to do two to 3,000 hours, I believe. Of direct the, service, of direct, like seeing yeah. individuals directly. And I don't, you know, I think I was telling you, Correct. I don't know of anybody in this area who really has a, a specialization like you are going to have in eating disorders treatments. Well, thank you. I'm really excited to get it because like you, um, I see the need for it in our community and there are not, uh, and we'll talk about this later, I think, but there's not a whole lot of resources in Tuscaloosa for eating disorder folks. So um, I'm just really excited to, to be able to be on this path. Talk about what are the signs of an eating disorder? Um, well, for someone who may be wondering if they have an eating disorder, it often starts out with thoughts like a preoccupation with their weight or their size or a distorted body image. They may feel a loss of control, but then the actual physical signs that, um, they may notice or friends or family may notice would be a sudden weight loss or sudden weight gain, um, strict dieting or restricting the foods for uh, like intermittent fasting. Um, a lot of uh, folks do that. Mm -hmm. Excessive exercise. Mm -hmm. um, some, some clients I've had report their hair falling out yeah. when they brush their hair. That's a big one. Um, counting calories and carbs, you know, if, if 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 someone is obsessed with foods and thoughts of food and it's like obsessive thinking, that's a really good indicator of a budding to full-blown eating disorder. Like you said, another thing would be use of diet pills, use of laxatives um, excessively, and then of course binging or binging and purging. So all of those kind of encompass all of the eating and, disorders. And I think there's, you know what, I mean, those sound pretty obvious to me. Yeah. yeah. And, but I think sometimes people just don't see any of these. You can be, sometimes you can be living with somebody right. and either they are hiding it so well that you don't notice it. Um, and I, I talk to many family members sometimes that that's admit that, that they had no idea. And I believe right. it because right. it's not that they're not paying attention. Mm -mm, it's just sometimes no. it's not a drastic change. Um, right. And if you don't, if you're not really paying attention and you don't know the signs yourself, you have no idea. No. And it is such a uh, shame ridden illness, you know, clients who ha report eating disorders have such a sense of shame and guilt and they don't want, they don't want people to know. So there is that, that secrecy about it. Oftentimes they'll wear, you know, baggy clothes right. or hoodies and oversized. Right. So, you know, for kids who college students who come away and they're away from their parents for three and four months at a time, you know, and then their parents see them, and then there's this drastic change. They're shocked sometimes. Uh, they're yes. in shock. Yeah. So, but it, it can be very difficult, like you said, especially like if there's a roommate situation, um, it, it can be very difficult to know if do you, someone is. Do you, um, do you see parents to, do you have parents to, to come to you or contact you and reach out to you because they have a child with maybe an eating disorder, maybe they don't know what eating disorder is and they need advice on how to get the person to some, someone like you or me. Right. Right. I do. Um, I've had several parents contact me. Um, I've had some that thought maybe their, their child might have an eating disorder. And then I've had some that while the um, child was in treatment or was getting therapy themselves, the parents wanted therapy 
to know how to deal with yeah. with the eating yeah. disorder and what their them. role in is it. Yeah. What is what are you know we've mentioned anorexia and bulimia. But what are the, I was reading in the same article I mentioned earlier about the different types, the different kinds of eating disorders. We've had a a while ago, I don't know, maybe five years ago, we had Uh a specialist on talking about orthorexia. And Uh at the time I had just discovered that that was considered another form of an eating disorder. Talk about what orthorexia is for those listening and have no idea. And then the other types of eating disorders. Okay. Um, Orthorexia is um it appears uh it's it's pretty tricky because it it doesn't appear like an eating disorder and orthorexia is a preoccupation with eating healthy eating clean eating good foods you know and in our society we've perpetuated all of these ideas about what foods are good and what foods are bad and of course we know that foods are neutral um but orthorexia that is how it starts out um i've had several clients who started out maybe they were vegan and just you know they had a vegan diet and then it kind of spiraled out of control with the orthorexia and it's just a a fascination with eating healthy and staying on that path and not straying from it it's very rigid rules about what can and cannot be eaten So for most people, that's a plant-based diet, you know, um, um, and that's as far as it goes. And of course, you don't get the nutrients you need, the fuel that your body needs. I read, um, I was reading this actually for something else yesterday, and the brain is the organ in the body that consumes the most energy. So if you are not eating anything of substance and you're eating salads and, um, you know, tofu all the time, you're not going to, you're not going to have that fuel that your brain needs. And that's why um, something I forgot to mention, um, another sign of eating disorders would be the brain fog that we see typically yeah. in clients with, with yes. eating disorders. Yes. Let's so take what orthorexia. I'm sorry. That's okay. No, I was just gonna take a let's take a short break and then when we come back, let's finish talking about the different kinds because there's more than just right. these three that we're talking about. And I want right. you to go into a little more detail about that. And also I want to okay. talk about some most common myths associated okay. with eating disorders. So hang tight, you're listening to Brain Matters on 90.7 the capstone. We'll be right back. WVUAFM, Tuscaloosa. This show is not a substitute for professional counseling and no relationship is created between the show hosts or guests and any listener. If you feel you are in need of professional mental health and are a UA student, we encourage you to contact the UA Counseling Center at 348-3863. If you are not a UA student, please contact your respective county's crisis service hotline or their local mental health agency or insurance company. If it is an emergency situation, please call 911 or go to your nearest emergency room. Listening to Brain Matters on 90.7 The Capstone. I'm Dr. BJ Gunther. We're talking tonight about eating disorders. We're going to talk about group therapy for eating disorders. And also, um, I want to mention our email in case you want to email us any questions about the show or have any topic ideas for future shows. Our emails. Uh, excuse me, our email address is brainmattersradio at wbuafm.ua.edu. So um, go ahead and send those to me. We're, I feel a little rusty tonight because this is our first show back from the summer break. And so, you know, I'm having a little brain fog myself. We just, <laughs> we just talked about brain fog, you know, as one of the symptoms or signs of an eating disorder. But when we, when we left off before the break, um, Sherman Char- uh, Rutherford is my guest tonight, and Sherman is very close to becoming certified. Um, what's the actual, tell, tell us again what's the actual certification, because I can't remember and I want to get it right. Certification it's, as. It's a, 
It's the Certified Eating Disorder Specialist. Yeah, because this is a big deal because like we were saying, yeah. there's not many people... I don't know of anybody around here in Tuscaloosa who have a certification in eating disorder. So when people find out and you start advertising with your certification, I'm afraid you're going to be overrun, to be honest. Right, you know. Right, so, right. But we were talking about the different types of eating disorders, anorexia, uh-huh. bulimia, orthorexia. What's next? Um, binge eating disorder. That's one that a lot of folks are not really familiar with. Um, binge eating disorder is where there are excessive amounts of food taken in at in short spurts of time. So that is when people um, often after binging, after a binge, they will um, sometimes restrict the next day or to make up for it, or they um, feel these, these feelings of guilt. And a lot of times that's where some suicidal ideation starts to creep in. So binge eating disorder doesn't, you know, people don't think of that as a very common one or one that's as serious as anorexia or bulimia, but it can be just as severe. Um, another one is ARFID, which is the avoidant and restrictive food intake disorder. Yes. Um, that typically uh, starts in childhood. You'll mm-hmm. see it in children who are picky eaters. And a lot of times it's not that the child is a picky eater. It's that the child has a problem with the texture of the food. And yes. you'll see that in some adults, that it's a texture thing. I so, think I've only um, had one person here at the university um, with right. that. And he only ate three things. Right. That's what it sounds like. Yep. And did did it start in when he was younger? You know, you I remember? can't remember, but I remember him talking about, uh, and it was it was food that you just. I mean, I know he wasn't getting the nu- nutrients that he needed. Right. It was something like right. French fries, um, and I remember him talking about his grandmother's macaroni and cheese. So that's all he macaroni ate, and like and mac cheese. and cheese. Mm-hmm. 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 And it yeah. did. It was to um, do with the texture. It it was something about the texture. Yeah. You're right. <laughs> And there is research that, um, well, it's been out, um, but like I have been kind of studying up on it because I was not as familiar with it. But then when I started studying about it and finding out more information, it makes sense that oftentimes people who are struggling with ARFID may also have um, be on the on the spectrum for autism. Because, okay. And that's a big indicator. So now. I think people are becoming more knowledgeable. And so when we're seeing people with ARFID or we are seeing people who are distribute signs of autism, then we're putting the two together instead of saying, oh, they're just picky. They don't want to eat. It's not that they don't want to eat. It's it's really the te- it's a texture. Yeah, they're and it's probably a sensory issue. Yeah, yeah. So those those are those are the main five: the anorexia, the bulimia, the binge eating disorder, ARFID, and then um, orthorexia. So what, those, uh, where does body dysmorphia fit in? And in the article I was reading, it, it mentions muscle dysfor- dysmorphia. And I've recently had a student come in, and she identified herself. She said, "I am severely body dysmorphic," and we talked about that. And I think I made a right. referral. So. Right. And most clients that I have worked with with body dysmorphia know that they have it because they they recognize that what they see when they look in the mirror is not what everybody else sees when they look okay. at them. Right. So, um, but that is typically where these eating disorder start that's like the budding process i think is where the body dysmorphia develops they're not happy with what they're seeing in the mirror and then that's what leads to trying to alter their appearance so what are what are what are some common myths associated with eating disorders that pe- who you know from okay. people who really don't don't know that much they've heard you know they've heard about bulimia and anorexia but they really don't right. know 
Right. Um, and I think the oldest myth that has been out there is that only Caucasian females develop eating disorders. Right. And that is certainly not true. Mm-hmm. Um, and then another um, myth that I am familiar with is that males do not develop eating disorders, which again is not completely- true completely untrue and then this is a big one um a lot of times in society if people don't look thin or frail or almost emaciated then we tend to think oh they're not sick they're not sick they're okay Mm -hmm. they're okay yeah so that is a big myth that you know everyone with an eating disorder looks like they have an eating disorder and that's certainly not true um and then the last myth i did want to touch on because i think this one is is important is that i have heard so many times from those who were uneducated or just didn't know that recovery is not possible from an eating disorder and it absolutely is so um i just wanted to put that out there that recovery is that is a possibility so there is hope and um it's out there so people can recover and they do recover you you know talking about men having eating disorders i just think they don't talk about it as much as women or because of the you know societal shame i mean we did a show catherine do you remember the ua baseball player we had on and he mm-hmm. had actually, you know, come forward with his story uh, about anorexia. He had anorexia yeah. while playing baseball. Yeah. And, I mean, I thought that was uh, pretty brave of him, you know, being on this campus and the way we see athletes on right. this campus, you know, and to recognize yeah. that it was an issue for him and he was getting treatment for it. So that was a big right. deal. Right. And then also, um, I think it's – Men or are, are males are not diagnosed as frequently as women, I believe, because for males, they have, like you said, the the muscular body types. We we chalk it all up to, oh, they're athletes. They, you know, they they're supposed to look that way. They're mm-hmm. supposed to work out five hours a day. They're supposed <laughs> to do all this. But, you know, sometimes that's not the case. It's it's not the case at all. So there are a lot of myths out there surrounding eating disorders. How many people do you have any idea? How many people have eating, you know, an eating disorder? Is there any way to know um, that? I guess there might not. Well, be. there probably is not an accurate number. Um, by most accounts of what they say is that 9%, and that sounds like a really low number to it me. Sure it sure does. It says that all the research that I have looked at shows that 9% of the U.S. population or 28.8 million Americans will have or develop a eating disorder in their lifetime. So when you say 9% of the population, that doesn't sound like much. But then when you say 28.8 million. That sounds like a lot. It sounds like a lot. Yeah. Do you think... um, do you think eating disorders are worse on college campuses? I do. I know. And I do. I, I think, and I hesitate I mean, to say that because, well, you but know, I think we know think it some is. of the reason why is the peer pressure stuff. It is. It is. And that's what um, I wanted to say was that, um, and I think this is something that we were going to talk about, um, you know, there are social, genetic, and environmental factors that go into eating disorders. And the social factor of wanting to be like everyone else else the diet culture that's out there the you know wanting to fit in with their peers wanting to look as good on game day as all of all of their friends do that is such a big thing on our campus i know so and i expect it's the same at all all college campuses but you know i can't tell you the times that i've had clients say to me 
well, I'm going to the game Saturday, so I'm not going to eat anything on Friday, so I won't look bloated in my, yes. in my my outfit, you know. And so, and that just seems like such a normal, not eating disorder type of thing to say, but it really is. It's perpetuating that that societal norm that this is how you're supposed to look. Uh-huh. So, so what? Yeah. Um, what? What causes, I mean, you said society, social, genetic, and environmental, but specifically, uh-huh. what do you think triggers or causes an eating disorder? You know, I can look back and think, for instance, the, the person I just mentioned with the body dysmorphia, she admitted that her mom has the same thing. So I right. don't know if that's a, I, I don't think it's necessarily um, in your biological makeup but maybe it is i think you get right. i think you model it right more, but that's you what, t- you tell I me mm-hmm. when i was re- i was researching that um it said that 28 to 74 percent of people who develop eating disorders it was genetic heritability so that they're saying between 28 and 74 percent it is genetic But I believe like you, some of that is modeled. Um, Mm -hmm. And and I think I think those numbers are probably higher because if if you've grown up in a house hearing your mom constantly be on a diet or I can't have that cookie or I'm only going to eat half of my salad. Yes. You know, that that kind of burns it into your to your mind, to your brain that. This is how I'm supposed to eat. So um, I believe there is the genetic component to it, the social environmental. And then I think another big, big factor is needing control over something. Oh, yes. And for for so many of of so many eating disorder clients, um, it is a need to feel in control of something. And I think when you put that in a college setting and people, uh, you know, students are coming in, they're making new friends, they're learning how to live with roommates, they're learning what their class schedules are, they're learning how to manage life and schoolwork and everything. So that's a big, um, it's, it's just like a... A swirling vortex of yes. factors, I yes. think, that just, they all come together to make the perfect storm for an eating disorder. I think you're right. Let's take another break. And then when we come back, I want to talk about the medical complications of an eating disorder. And then okay. I want to get into the treatment and to talk about individual therapy versus or and or group therapy, which is what you're offering also. So hang on. We'll, we'll be right back. You're listening to Brain Matters on 90.7. In the capstone. WVUA FM, Tuscaloosa. This show is not a substitute for professional counseling and no relationship is created between the show hosts or guests and any listener. If you feel you are in need of professional mental health and are a UA student, we encourage you to contact the UA Counseling Center at 348-3863. If you are not a UA student, please contact your respective county's crisis service hotline or their local mental health agency or insurance company. If it is an emergency situation, please call 911 or go to your nearest emergency room. back listening to Brain Matters on 90.7 The Capstone. I'm Dr. B.J. Gunther. We're talking tonight with Sharman Rutherford. She's an LPC, which is a licensed professional counselor and about to be uh, certified as an eating disorder specialist. We're talking tonight about eating disorders and we left off um, talking about what's caught what causes an eating disorder and i want to mention that we have an email here at brain matters if you have questions about this or any other topics or you feel like you have some ideas for our upcoming shows for this fall and maybe even in the spring email those to me at brain matters radio um hold on i just i just said brain fog brain matters radio at wvuafm.ua.edu i don't know why i get stuck on that i think it's because it's so long um but anyway, Sherman, talk a little bit about, to me, this is the most 
This is the most important and scariest part about an eating disorder is the medical complications. And mm-hmm. you see it with, you know, there's there's different I have seen different medical problems with anorexia versus bulimia with mm-hmm. regards to like teeth and throat mm-hmm. erosion um, as opposed to just malnutrition with anorexia right. and right. electrolyte imbalances. So talk about what the medical complications are. That that those were some that I were going to mention was the um, the uh, erosion of the teeth, um, malnutrition, dehydration, uh, joint issues, muscle weakness, um, constipation, dizziness, fatigue. Um, and then it goes on to the more serious issues of organ damage, infertility, and then ultimately death if it's if it's left untreated. So, um, you know, those some of the things like dizziness, constipation, um, muscle weakness, those don't sound very important or like they would be very damaging. But when you put all of that together and then then add to the the um you add to the mix that your brain is not being fed that just also sets up a um a recipe for disaster recipe for disaster basically yes with mental disorders too because eating disorders can then cause depression anxiety uh ocd um perfectionism Mm -hmm. self-harm and suicidal ideation so, you know, not only do you have the physical risk factors when you, there are eating disorders, you have the mental risk factors that go along with it, too. So all of those, that is just the perfect recipe. And, um, you know, it, it depending on where someone is in their eating disorder journey, those can be very real things that they're facing. You know, I think anybody who's um, reaching out for counseling sometimes, no matter if it's depression or stress management or what or even an eating disorder, I think a lot of times they're coming to counseling because maybe they've done some research on their own and they think they're going to hear something different from us. Right. So Uh even with eating disorders, if somebody finds this podcast down the road, I mean, what is it that could be, I don't know how to say this, but could be different that they could take from what we're talking about. And so they don't just like kind of roll their eyes and think, oh, I've heard that before, you know, or that they're being told the same thing because this is reversible. I mean, I guess there comes a point where I I mean, I guess there comes a point where it's not reversible. Is that true when when it's gotten so far gone and nobody's gotten any treatment? And you're close right. to dying, but for the most part, or they can reverse. Or I've seen, yeah, I've seen clients go to treatment, go into treatment, very close-minded, um, say and do the things they think that the the treatment providers want them to do and come out and haven't gotten anything out of treatment. What I wish people could do is um, talk to some of the people that sit in, sit in our offices. And I'm sure you have the people that are struggling with this, that are fainting during the day, that they can't walk to class because they can't get there because things are so bad. So, and oftentimes you don't realize how bad it is until you are in the thick of it. And that's when it's important to reach out and to get help and to try to figure out what you can do to reverse the cycle. Is it, is it preventable? Yes. So eating disorders are preventable. What I, if, believe they are. I, I do too. I think it, I think the key is, education maybe yeah, maybe starting to are they you know i don't have children in school so i don't know if it's talked about at an early age do, you know do you know anything about the schools around here do they ask you to come and speak and how mm-hmm. early you know mm-hmm. i i i have had clients um tell me that Um, I've had a couple with ARFID who started out, you know, they can say, I remember when I was four years old, I wouldn't eat 
you know, broccoli or I wouldn't eat hamburger meat because I didn't like the texture and I wouldn't, you know, so um, it starts very early. I think this is just from my experience and talking to my clients, middle, middle school, middle school seems to be where a lot of this starts, starts to develop, you know, they start getting into dance or they're in cheerleading or they're in gymnastics or, or, you know, the males are engaged in sports. And so there's that ideal body of what you're supposed to have as an athlete. And then that's kind of praised. And, um, I just, I, I think, I think prevention and education go hand in hand. I think that might be the area that we're lacking in because yeah, it's like nobody so. wants to talk about it still. Even though we're talking about it now, right. it's right. critical sometimes to even talk about it in parent organizations through the school because you have right. a captive audience. You know what I mean? Right. Well, and you have so many parents in the mindset of, I need to lose 20 pounds. I need to lose 40 pounds. I need to fit into this dress for my daughter's graduation. So when you have parents that are passing this stuff down, you know, it's it's really hard to stop that cycle yeah. if, if something doesn't change. It's yeah, it really does. hard to well, get in there and stop it. How, talk about your group therapy. What, tell us the details. Is there a name of it? How long does it last? Is there evidence yes. that group therapy provides as good or better treatment for eating disorders? There is evidence for that. I don't have the numbers on that, but there statistically it shows that um, um, group therapy along with individual therapy is what works for um, most clients. So the group that I'm doing is um, it's the fall 2022 college wellness and recovery small group. And it is an eight week small group. And I only will allow um, clients who are in, in, in therapy with me, or they have to be enrolled at the counseling center in therapy because I don't want topics or things coming up in group that they they can't deal with individually. Right. So it is a closed right. group. So they have to have that support from somewhere else. But um, it's eight week sessions. I mean, it's eight weekly sessions. Um, and some of the topics we cover are diet culture and disordered eating. We do a week on shame, guilt, repeat, those fun um, emotions that we all experience. We talk about body image, self-worth, bridging the nutrition gap, exercise, is it too much, achieving a life balance, and then recovery and maintenance. So each each week is specifically targeted to something. I have had to push the dates back. I'm probably going to start the group in October. So if you have anyone who is listening to this to this. Um, podcast and they want to join they can get in touch with you know they can reach out to y'all they can reach out to me um because the group is limited to 10 participants okay i was going to ask how many are are you limiting it to and is it going to be in person or via zoom or how what's the how are you going to it will be via zoom and it is um like i said it's limited to 10 participants um they do have to be in therapy either at the UA Counseling Center or with me at All Things New. Um, and we just talk. And, you know, there's a lot to be said about group therapy. And there's a lot to be said about knowing that you're not alone. Is there? Yes, definitely. Because I think mm-hmm. that um, that's a very they need more support and right. to be and and to feel more comfortable uh, that helps right. to disband the shame too yeah. you know yeah. to know you're not alone do you have um a way to screen the individuals who are going to be in the group and how i don't know how to ask this how severe what if somebody is severely anorexic is there a limit of the 
people's um, symptoms that can be in the group. Do, do you understand what I'm talking about? I don't, I don't think like, I asked that well. Like, are you saying if they need a higher level of care, right. if I would accept right. them into the group? Right. No, it, are there, it, is there anybody you won't allow to be in the group based on if, symptoms? If, if that, yes, based on their symptoms. Uh-huh. If they are, if they are binging and purging after every meal, uh, after every time they eat, that would, that would, to me, that needs a higher level of care. Right. If there's someone severely anorexic that hasn't eaten in, you know, 24 hours, 48 hours. Um, and that's very common, Yep. you know, to that's, that's common. But, um, you know, so there are people who I would, who I would screen out. And I have had to do that in the past because they felt I felt that they needed a higher level of care. So um, that's kind of the that's kind of an area that I'm working on trying to develop um, because a lot of people who need a higher level of care are very resistant. And it almost feels like, well, this can offer them something. But if it's not going to help them, then it's not going to be beneficial. If it's is there a cost? Does insurance cover it? Or is it, there a it, cost? It is, it is $400 for the eight weekly sessions. That includes all the materials. And um, they, they, everybody who comes gets like this, this, um, um, Packet, Workbook. Uh, oh, packet. Notebook, notebook, notebook with packets of information so that when they leave group, they don't just forget everything that we've said. So like it can be, you know, these groups can get pretty emotional sometimes. So if you are in an emotional state and talking about something really deep, the chances of you retaining what we talked about in group is not likely. So yeah. Yes, that's what the notebook is for, so that people have something to take back with them. Do you um, you I mentioned in the intro college boot camp that you also uh-huh. what is that something totally different from the eating it disorder is. group? Okay, what is that? Yes, it, it is, and I have not started that yet this year because I haven't um had any um anyone to sign up for it yet. Um, I usually take eight eight students um, into that. And that is for, um, I hate to single out um, the guys and not allow them, but it is for female students only. Um, It's for college students. um, And we talk about um, study skills, time management, stress relief, um, work, uh, um, school life balance. We talk about all of those things. We talk about test anxiety. We talk about all of the things that go along with the transition of getting to college. And maybe if you've, if, if they've been in college for a year or two and things aren't working and everything's falling apart, then maybe they need to come in and, you know, figure out how can I have the best college experience? Because that's what we want, right? We want these students to come in. We want them to be healthy. We want them to be happy. We want them to be successful. And that's what college boot camp is. How, excuse me, how long will that last? How, how many um, weeks will it, that last? It, uh, college, college boot camp is eight weeks as well. It sounds like it's more um, geared for freshmen. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. But I have had um, some sophomores and juniors in the class just because of the stress management components and other things that we've talked about in it. Well, so, and a lot of um, these students are coming in with so many hours that hourly they're sophomores or juniors, but emotionally right. and age wise, they're freshmen. Right. I mean, I had a student today who she said, my birthday's next week. I said, she's a freshman. I said, are you going to be 19? She said, no, 18. So they just yeah. are getting younger. And she even told me she had a couple of friends who were 16. Right. Right. So in college. And, and you think about it, you have a 16 or 17 year old on a college campus with 21 year olds and that is a you know that's a very big deal that's a big deal. it's it's a little scary it makes me i'm gonna be honest and here i'm gonna put it right out there but it makes me wonder about some of these parents because yeah who would send their child 
literally 16 year old across the country to the university right. about the big bad university of alabama with the almost 40,000 students yeah 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 <sighs> there i ran it for a minute um they'll probably edit that out probably, <laughs> probably. <laughs> let's take a probably few minutes of that out. let's take a few let, well they told me just don't cuss bj you can <laughs> say anything just don't cuss so i've done well um let's take another quick break we'll come back for a final um segment and i want to talk about your recommendations for resources and books and whatnot so um stay with us you're listening to brain matters on 90.7 the capstone wvua fm tuscaloosa this show is not a substitute for professional counseling and no relationship is created between the show hosts or guests and any listener. If you feel you are in need of professional mental health and are a UA student, we encourage you to contact the UA Counseling Center at 348-3863. If you are not a UA student, please contact your respective county's crisis service hotline or their local mental health agency or insurance company. If it is an emergency situation, please call 911 or go to your nearest emergency room. You're back listening to Brain Matters on 90.7 The Capstone. I'm BJ Gunther, and we're talking about eating disorders. And my um, guest is Charmin Rutherford. She is a licensed professional counselor about to be certified in, as an eating disorder specialist here in Tuscaloosa. And we've been just talking about signs of an eating disorder, what kinds there are, how prevalent it is in the college student population. Uh, resor- we're, well, I want to talk about resources, but if it's preventable and treatment. And also, Charmin offers an eight-week-long um, eating disorder group. So and, and group therapy and individual are really the combined the best approach, along with I'm sure you do this like we do here at the counseling center recommendations and referrals for a team approach where you refer to a dietitian, medical doctor. Um, I don't know if there's anybody else you, you know, refer to for the team approach for treating this because it's the most successful um, right. way to treat this. Right. Right. So tell us about some resources. Um, any book recommendations, any websites, any apps? I do. I do. I have um I have four books that I wanted to recommend. These are my very favorite books for um clients to read or you know, anyone who thinks they may have an eating disorder or they may be developing an eating disorder. Um, the first book is Health at Every Size by Linda Bacon. Um, the second one is Intuitive Eating by Evelyn Trebol, that's T-R-I-B-O-L-E, and Elise Resch, it's R-E-S-C-H, and they are both registered dietitians. So okay. they, it is a excellent resource for intuitive eating and teaching people to honor their hunger cues and, you know, how to... Uh, honor their fullness cues and and it's a really good book um another one perfect girls starving daughters Mm. by courtney martin okay and then goodbye ed hello me by jenny schaefer okay that's a good title yeah those are um all of those are really good. And I I ask clients that are in therapy with me to read some of those. So, um, and everyone that I have recommended them to has really gotten a lot out of. Okay, wonderful. Any, um, any suggestions for, I guess, uh, movies or videos or YouTube videos or apps or a uh, podcast even? I had not thought about movies really. Um, I, um, there are some apps. I'm not familiar with like uh, self self help apps with eating disorders, but I am. I use an app with my clients, and it's called Recovery Record. 
And if I have a client who had, who is struggling with disordered eating or uh, full-blown eating disorders, um, what it is, is they go in, it's, I, it's, it's paid for um, by me. The, the client doesn't pay anything. Uh-huh. And the app kind of keeps track of what they eat, what their thoughts are, what they're feeling when they're eating. So it's very discreet. They can just, you know, if they're sitting down to eat a meal, um, you know, right after they can sit down and log, wow. you know, what they've eaten. That what sounds their great. Were. Yeah, but it, it is called, it's called Recovery Record, and it is a great resource. I use that with my clients. Well, Sharman, thank you so much for all this information. And I hope, you know, I hope the group starts soon because yeah, it sounds like it's a much October needed. First. Yeah, yeah, my birthday. Um, is that by the way? Night? Yes, it is. By Happy the birthday. way. Thank you. But I hope it does well. I hope you get some referrals from us as well as the community even, you know. Um, and I think. Like I said, I think when word gets out, you you might be overrun because there's yeah. just nothing. The closest is Birmingham, you know, and it's right. just so hard. You can tell it's just so hard to get in with anybody right now, it even is. if it's it like is. a dermatologist or, a, you know, you're a family doctor. It's just hard to get in with people right now. So right. I'm glad right. to hear there's something local and you're that close to getting the certification. Yes. Yes. It won't be long now. Well, thank you so much. Let me make a few announcements before we go. Don't forget our okay. shows are recorded and podcasted on Apple Podcasts, also on audioboom.com and voices.ua.edu. You just type in Brain Matters and you'll find some of our past shows. There's a link to voices.ua.edu on our Counseling Center's website. It's counseling.ua.edu. I always like to give credit and thank the people who've made my show possible. Dr. Greg Vanderwall, he's our Executive Director here at the Counseling Center. We couldn't do the show without Terry Siggers of the Office of Student Media and also the produ- my production assistant, Catherine Howell, who's also my colleague at the Counseling Center and just passed her social work um, boards, right? Your test, your big one. I don't even know the name of it because I'm a counselor, so I don't even know the name, but she just passed it. The LSCSW. Yay! L-I-C-S-W. So that's a big deal. That's a big deal. So she's excited. Congratulations. I want to thank the WVUA staff. Um, I believe Chloe is going to be the production person. She's the um, head of production at WVUA. So she's going to be editing our show. And it's that's just invaluable. And of course, my guest tonight, Sharman Rutherford. Join us again next week. Our topic's going to be, this is an interest. I can't wait to hear this because I was just talking to a student today about this, how cleaning helps college students feel their best is that cool thanks again for listening tonight we'll see you next week take care good night This show is not intended as a substitute for professional counseling. Further, the views, opinions, and conclusions expressed by the show hosts or their guests are their own and not necessarily those of the University of Alabama, its officers, or trustees. Any views, opinions, or conclusions shared on the show do not create a relationship between the host or any guest and any listener, and such a relationship should never be inferred. If you feel you're in need of professional mental health and are a UA student, please contact the UA Counseling Center at 348-3863. If you are not a UA student, please contact Contact your respective county's crisis service hotline or their local mental health agency or insurance company.